Hello, everyone. This is Gabriel. I'm in my office here at Notre Dame, as usual. This is a really interesting episode, especially if you have interest in the translation of the Quran. But really, if you uh, just want to get to know a fascinating, brilliant, intellectual shokat, Turawa of Yale University, uh, I would really encourage you to listen to the end of this one, because we start by speaking about his own journey um, through different countries, including Mauritius. Uh, and uh, that led him eventually to becoming the chair, uh, a chair of um, NELC, Near Eastern uh, Languages and Civilizations at Yale. And then we continue to speak about great works of literature generally, uh, and then continue on to the questions about Quran translations. And we get to some really big ones. For example, uh, do you have to be a believer to translate the Quran? And then finally, we turn to his effort to translate the Quran in a way which communicates his own convictions about the beauty of the text. Uh, so listen to the end. Hey, um, I'm really glad you're here. Thank you for taking a moment to start watching this video. Hope you watched through the end. And I'd be really grateful if you just take a moment to subscribe and like. I know everyone like subscribe to the channel, like this video. I know everyone asked that, um, but uh, for someone who's uh, got lots and lots of academic responsibilities with students and other things like this, uh, and who makes no money off of doing these videos, um, seeing those likes and uh, subscriptions really motivates me to keep on producing this content. So thank you for doing that. Enjoy the conversation with Shokat Turawa. Here we go again. Professor Shokat Turawa, great to be with you. Thanks for joining me on Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to speak about the Quran generally, but especially the question of translating the Quran, uh, you are well known to many for not only your work in Islamic studies and religious questions, but also literary questions. So we'll get into all of that. I have a brief introduction I'll read, and then we'll get to know you a little bit better and then speak about translating the Quran. Sound okay? Great. Okay, off we go. So everyone, friends, Professor Shokat Turawa is Professor of Arabic, Professor of Comparative Literature, and Chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Yale. He is also an executive editor of the Library of Arabic Literature, an initiative to edit and translate significant texts of the pre-modern Arabic literary heritage. He received his BA, MA, and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and has taught at Duke University, the University of Mauritius, and Cornell University before moving on to Yale. He's interested in the Quran as a literary text, the writerly culture of 9th and 10th century Baghdad. That's uh, Shokat's words, so maybe you can help help, me, help us understand that. And then also the Wakwak tree and islands in modern world literatures. Okay, so I have to query two things in the introduction. First is writerly culture. What does that mean? So when I was working on my uh, thesis and then my subsequently the monograph that arose out of it, I was trying to find a way to render the adab, uh, this uh, famously untranslatable word, from uh, which more or less uh, in the modern period means literature, but in the pre-modern period, as you know, uh, meant everything from conduct to um, to etiquette to probably prose output. Uh, and I was trying to find a way in the context of the figure I was studying, who was a ninth century bookseller, a way of, of rendering that. Um, I liked uh, Rosenthal's translation of Adib or rendering of Adib as bookman or bookman. Mm. But uh, I didn't, because of the connotations of the word bookish in English, I couldn't talk about bookish culture or, and I thought I could talk about book culture, but then what was lost was the fact that the figure I was studying, who was a warraq, who was a, a scribe and a copyist, um, was also a writer, an author, a katib, and I thought writerly culture, which when I first used, people were quite annoyed with because it's a it's a bit hard to say, writerly. Uh, but I'm delighted to say that it's caught on, and you know you find people now writing about uh, pre-modern Arabic and throwing in the word the, right. the expression writerly culture to mean something a bit larger. But you know that's been yeah. that's been nice to see. And then you we have mentioned in your introduction also of one of your interests namely the wakwak -wak tree. So in just, you know, a brief, uh, you know, moment or two, how, what's the wakwak -wak tree? So the wakwak -wak tree is a tree uh, in described in Arabic geographies and imaginary writing, imaginary literature, also Persian, Turkish, and other languages, uh, a tree which uh, is on an island. Sometimes that island is, is called the wakwak -wak island, sometimes it's not, on which women grow as fruit. And this has been uh, represented in manuscripts, talked about, 
Uh, and I got interested in it because when I was living in Mauritius very briefly, which is where my family is from as an adult, I was trying to find ways to combine my interests, my continuing interest in pre-modern Arabic with being in uh, the Southwest Indian Ocean. And I realized that I was essentially in a part of the world where the wak wak tree purportedly was supposed to be found. Yes. Yeah, and then I got I got interested in that, as you know. In fact, I believe the last time I was at Notre Dame, that's what I spoke about. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah I remember it well. Yeah. Oh, okay, terrific. So before we get into our um, main topic, namely translating the Quran, uh, this is just a great opportunity for people to get to know Shokat Turawa better. Uh, so, you know, um, you don't have to start from the beginning, um, but could you maybe just um, tell us a little bit about your background, especially how eventually you got into Islamic studies, Quranic studies, literary studies? Sure. In fact, I think I should start from the beginning because it, okay. it, it, I think it's illuminating. Uh, others would have to decide what the role is of some of these things. But I was born in England to uh, parents from, from, from the island of Mauritius who met in England. And, and I grew up uh, mainly in subsequently in Paris and then in Singapore. And Singapore is where I did high school. I went to an international school, but a British mold international school. Okay. And I did not know what I wanted to do uh, in college or in, for that matter in my life uh, as a career. And uh, I sort of flirted with the idea of studying or reading law in England. And my mother didn't think that was a great thing for me to want to aspire to do. I believe she said, why would you want to make a living lying? And, um, and so I thought, okay, well, and then I learned something I did not really fully know, fully realize, which is that you could go to the state, United States and not have decided what you want to do, unlike England and much of the rest of the world where you where you go into a course. And so um, I thought I'll go to the States. And uh, but then I, was, I had to decide how I was going to limit where I was going to apply. And I thought, well, I like literature. I like languages. Why don't I study a new language? And the three languages I decided were candidates at that point as a 17 year old who didn't really know what he wanted to do. Um, were uh, Arabic just because I knew how to read it as a person who was raised a Muslim, but I didn't understand it. I didn't, you know, as is the case for many Muslims or even members of other religious traditions with their texts, their scripture. Uh, I thought Gujarati because my family is ancestrally from Gujarat and my parents uh, read, spoke and wrote Gujarati, but didn't speak it to me. When we lived in England, they spoke to me in English. When we lived in France, they spoke to me in French. When we moved to the Far East, we were speaking in English. Uh, and um, I said to someone, you know, oh, I'm thinking of going to the States and studying Arabic. And that person said, oh, why wouldn't you go to the Azhar? Or why wouldn't you go to the Arab world to study Arabic? And my response to that wasn't, oh, that's right. That's what I should do. My response to myself was, well, I'm going to America. I should learn an American language. And so the other language on my list was Hopi. Hmm. I thought it would be good to learn a Native American language right? Uh, because I was going to be in America. When I got to the University of Pennsylvania, which is where I chose to go, which is one of the few universities that taught all three. Uh, Roger Allen, uh, now emeritus professor of Arabic, modern Arabic literature at Penn, told me, you can always learn Gujarati anytime. It's your ancestral language. The professor of Hopi is on leave this semester. You should study Arabic. In fact, you should study intensive Arabic and take it 10 hours a week. And I did that. And three weeks into it, uh, I had a, I, won't, I wouldn't call it an epiphany, but I had a, something of a realization. I realized that I really wanted to be Roger Allen. I wanted to be this this man who would drive on his ride on his bicycle to work every day and teach classes on Arabic literature and mm. and I thought you know how do I do that and he so I asked him because he was my advisor and and he said oh well you do a degree in Arabic and then you do a PhD in Arabic and then you find a job at a university and I said that's what I'll do and he goes you know it's only your freshman year and I said no that's my that's my um, current plan that that isn't to say that it's not going to change but at least I have something to work toward. Right. Um, you know, I'm going to cite something I've, I've been citing a lot lately, which is uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower said, he said it in the context of battle, but he said, uh, in, in preparing for battle, I have found that planning is indispensable, mm. but plans are useless. Mm. And and I, and I that's more or less how I've operated throughout my life. Mm. You have to have a general idea what you're going to do to give you some sense of direction. But what actually happens is, you know, is uh, things unfold subject to the yeah subject to the um, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and providence and, and whatnot and God. But uh, so that's how I got into Arabic, and I I essentially worked on modern Arabic poetry when I got in, involved in pre-modern again, 
I worked on this figure, Ibn Abi Tahir, who was a bookseller in Baghdad. There was nothing relating to the Quran whatsoever. But two things happened. One, I was in Medina, and I was the Friday, uh, on a, at a Friday Fajr morning prayer with my family. Uh, and uh, it was 1988 or 89. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, the prayer leader read uh, Surah Insan, also called Surah Dahar. And my uncle turned to me and said, you know, what's that What's that Surah about? So I explained it to him. And um, and I said, we should go find a translation. And we went to find a translation. And he read it. And he said, this translation is awful. And I said, well, all translations are awful, really. So um, not because I have some theory about the untranslatability of the Quran, but just because I, I, ha I had never felt that Quran translation was of a very high standard as English, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um and uh and he said well why don't you translate something and so that was one impetus and i did i translated surah yasin which he actually distributed in mauritius uh where he was living and i wasn't yet uh piously you know to for people to to read mm -hmm. a couple of years later i got invited to a conference at the university of london the soas conference the conference uh, uh the quran conference that was held every two years and um I presented a paper, I don't remember on what, and Professor Abdul Halim, uh, who is, of course, well known to you and is a translator of the Quran and a professor of Quranic studies, said to me, I know you're working on all this literature stuff, but you know, when are you going to actually work on the Quran, which is where you should be working? Hmm. So those two things, those two um, sentiments expressed by two very different people sort of pushed me into thinking a little bit more about the Quran and and being a uh, someone who thinks of himself as a scholar of literature. I thought I would do that with the Quran. Think of it, think about it, approach it, access it as a literary text. And as you know, this is what I've been doing for the last 20, yes. 23 years. So. Beautiful, beautiful. We'll turn to some specific examples uh, later in our conversation of your translations. Uh, if we could pause though, to think about liter literature generally, and um, you made an allusion in your autobiographical, uh, autobiographical comments there about sensitivity towards the target language of towards the, the quality of the English in Quran translations. So um, uh, I'd like to ask you what um, what sorts of works in the history of English literature and spe specifically uh, you would hold up as examples of good writing. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, these will be things that ha were personally impactful for you, but maybe principally good writing that um, we should take into account when thinking about English. Uh, well, I mean, as you know, I could cite a lot of things and, you know, there's a lot of, there's consensus around a lot of this. There's also um, uh, disagreement about what is good writing and so on. I think just off the bat, two of the best wordsmiths in English uh, by, for my money are um, Toni Morrison and uh, uh, Kutseya, J.M. Kutseya, who I think have just, you know, they have scalpel-like um mm -hmm. Uh, ability to write uh, obviously there are writers who write in different modes they're very different the one from the other but i mean implicit in your question is that if we're exposed to good writing we're likely to at least know what good writing is and perhaps be able to produce it ourselves the the difficulty of course is that if you're not a poet you can't write poetry i'm not a poet so my translations of the quran aspire to be poetic or literary or whatever but but i don't have those chops or or that talent so um that's that's the, a problem but it is true that I think I'm probably a re relatively good reader of this material. Mm -hmm. I would say poetry is a good place to go. I myself, when I was um, the first substantial bit of Arabic that I translated was the was a, a poetry collection by Adonis, and uh, Adonis, the um, still living uh, Arabic poet. Not not everyone thinks he's the greatest poet, the greatest modern Arab poet. Um, but as Samuel Hazo, the American poet, once said. There is Arabic poetry before Adonis and there is Arabic poetry after Adonis. So, you mm. know, a signal figure in the manner of Eliot mm. or someone like that. And so I started to translate him and he was famously hard to translate. This is what I learned from people, from Roger Allen and others. And so I went to see the poet in residence at the University of Pennsylvania where I was, um, Daniel Hoffman. And I said, can I take your poetry writing seminar? And he said, well, the only way to be admitted to my poetry writing seminar is to submit poetry. And I said, well, but I, I'm not an aspiring poet. I just want to be able to translate poetry better. And if I can get a better understanding of how poets craft their poetry, maybe that will rub off on my, my translation. And he said, look, um, you still need to submit two poems. So I submitted two poems and he admitted me. I don't know if he lowered the bar. I suspect he did. Uh, but one of the things he said to me was, please don't tell anyone that you're here to learn how to translate. 
let everyone think you're also here to learn how to be a poet um mm -hmm. so that i treat you all equally mm -hmm. and, you know and um so i learned a lot from having someone in class look at poetry that we were producing and having that person say this is ridiculous this is brilliant move this uh you know, this three stanza poem is act only the sec only the first line and the eighth line are workable. You know, it, it, you know the, the way right, that critique right. works, all constructive. Right. So that I think is as important as reading good material. Okay. okay. If I were going to read something, um, if I were going to tell someone to read something, uh, it would be uh, the poetry of Charles Causley. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a follow up question, which you can take a pass on if you want. But is there work of literature again, thinking of English principally that is largely thought of as uh, masterful, uh, which uh, you find, uh, in fact, not so masterful and disappointing. You, you mean the level of language or something that's been that's held up as a kind of something you know, that's word... held up generally? I don't yeah, know. Confederacy, Confeder Confederacy of Dunces, mm. which everyone was raving about when I was in, in school. Uh, and then very and I'm going to say this and, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to say this because he's been in the news lately for a heinous um, attack on him, but people hold a uh, Midnight's Children up as this uh, brilliant um, work. And not only did it win the Booker Prize, but it won the Booker of Bookers. And um, so after 50 years of giving the prize, they picked the best book. And I find um, I find Midnight's Children to be um, uh, overwrought. This is Rushdie, and right? This is Rushdie, yeah. Yes. Um, I like a lot of his early material. I think that's held up as a kind of standard. And I think it's because we're, um, we're enamored of what he's done in it, but I don't know that it's as uh, as brilliant a book as everyone says. Um, I actually read that in I, I find it, all of his things to be very difficult to read just to, to stay focused and follow it, but- uh, His early um, stuff is very, very good. I mean, I think it's some of the best. And I think his nonfiction is some of the best writing you can find. I mean, if you want a, a, a model for nonfiction for writing, non which he represents it, yeah. But the book that I read at the same time as I was reading, um, Midnight Chil Midnight's Children was Amitav Ghosh's In an Antique Land, mm -hmm. which I think is a sublime uh, a text as well. So, but you know what I've what I've noticed? I've been telling my students this lately. I, I've noticed that often when you ask someone, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite um, uh, song? What's your favorite album? It's usually something that marked them between the ages of 13 and 17, mm. no matter what they've read after. Right. Yes. And because I must say this, I will say this. I, I'm one of those people who thinks Shakespeare is one of the best things since sliced bread. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, let's he start. Predates, he actually probably predates sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's start um, speaking about the Quran then, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe just generally speaking about principles of translation when and we can apply it to the Quran. Uh, but um, uh, you know, I had a student who worked on a translation of the Quran by Muhammad Asad. Very unique example of Quran translation. Uh, and he added lots of notes with his particular and, and sometimes idiosyncratic ideas about the Quran's theology, um, about the prophets, miracles, these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, he was very intent in, in uh, trying to classify earlier Quran translations as focused on source language, so on Arabic or target language, in this case, English. He only studied English translations of Quran. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, is is this a good way to start thinking about translations and translating? Um, some people care about representing the source language, the Arabic, in a way that is somewhat transparent in the target language in English, or and other while others are interested in, I don't know, rendering idioms with not the same words uh, or equivalents of the same words, but with a similar idiom in the new language. And so emphasis on the target language. Yeah. So your thoughts on that? So my thoughts on that. I think if the question is simply which of those two mechanisms or modes is preferable, I would go with the pay attention to the target language, mm -hmm. language into which you are translating. Uh, the reason I say, and that is if we're trying to produce a translation. Um, the I think the difficulty with the Quran is, is who is translating it and who they believe their audience is. And so many people, evidently, based on the on the end product, are are interested in uh, producing something that in a way is almost transparently the Arabic text, but in English words. And so they become very attached or remain very attached to the Arabic syntax, to um, uh, specific words being rendered in a way that maybe already is circulating within um, Muslim communities. 
So this doesn't have to be a, a method that is used only by Muslim translators. It could be used by non-Muslim translators, but it's attention to that. Uh, and I find that, uh, I understand that instinct, but I find that it ends up um, diminishing uh, the range and grandeur and sublimeness of the text. Uh, any any Arabic reader of the, any reader of the Arabic text uh, who comes at it without any conceptions or preconceptions about it recognizes that it's uh, unusual and and at, at times quirky, at times very elevated and sublime, at times very um, uh, uh, what's the right word forceful, right? I mean it's 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 a complicated text and that gets lost uh, when the translations are very um, wedded to the Arabic syntax. Or so let me Arabic. follow up about that and with an anecdote. I think we were both at a panel at an International Chronic Studies Association meeting. Maybe, maybe it was the first one when Arthur Droge spoke. Uh, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think you put that panel together. I put it, and I invited him. Okay. Yes. So I, there's one remark he made. Uh, besides, he made some quip about uh, Arthur Arbery and Arthur Droge, um, about the two Arthurs. But other than that, the other the other thing I remember from his talk is he said, "Well, what I um, aspire to do in my translation is to let the roughness of the Arabic show through." So, um, you know, maybe that's a judgment on the quality of the Arabic that you would disagree with. So perhaps you could speak to that. Um, but I think that was his way of saying, this is why my translation is oriented towards the source language, uh, because I, I don't want to uh, smooth things over and, um, you know, impose my own sense of beauty on the text. I, I want readers to be able to feel the roughness of the original. A yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, he he genuinely feels that way, and in fact, I've I've gone on record as saying that I like his translation. Um, I think I, I think my blurb appears on the back of the of the of the book. But the 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 difficulty with that is um, is the eva the evaluative, right? Uh, what is what does it mean that it's rough? I mean, I hesitated when I was trying to find words to characterize grammar. What does it mean that it's rough or that it's beautiful. Uh, there's no question that Muslims think the Quran is beautiful, and one of the signs of it is if you if you if you observe someone listening who does not understand Arabic, but even those who do listening to the Quran being recited, and the Quran is recited in exactly the same way as you go throughout through the Quran, right? And you you're on a passage which is describing the beauty of paradise, and then and then it transitions to the horrors of hell. The intonation remains the same. The, the the affection that the reciter has for the text remains the same and the listeners remains the same. They don't suddenly, you know, balk at the descriptions of hell and then get transported by the descriptions of paradise or, or unless they recognize the passage because it's dear to them. They're, they're, the, the affective is relatively, Muslims like listening to the Quran irrespective of what is happening. So whether we like it or not as translators, I think we have a certain responsibility to convey to the English reading um, public uh, how and why that might be the case. And so I I aspire to that. Um, I think in the case of uh, Droge, um, he was he was clear about who his audience was too. I mean, he was interested in people, he was interested in right, translating for people who are comparatists, who work in comparative religion. So even though he may say, and in fact do things in a way that suggest that it's about the roughness it's also he was also very much being animated by the necessity of showing how things relate to other scriptures mm -hmm. uh, and and that's that's and that's only correct we can't be motivated i don't think by only one uh one thing and produce a successful translation one has to keep in mind and it's that juggling or uh yeah juggling is not the best image but it's that balancing act yes right of yes. how to and and i think it's a balancing act also with source and target right do you as you rightly point out do you keep a um an unusual uh particularly seventh century arabian uh, metaphor or expression i mean do you for example the one that comes to mind is when uh, people are biting their their fingertips right do you keep that how do you convey anger you keep, you know, their faces were blackened, you know, these kind of expressions in, in, the, in the in Quran or in poetry. 
uh, or do you find the equivalent in English? Yes. Uh, that's a struggle, I think, for translators. My over time, I have moved further and further away from the source text and more and more to the uh, target language. But that's been motivated by um, a need that I perceive, which is I and I feel this way about the Quran, but I also feel this way about Arabic literature by some of the, of the some of the the Arabic literature that we regard as, as as masterpieces or as great works. You know, I want English readers when they pick it up and read it, not to say either what's the big deal. I don't I don't see what the big deal is because the translator hasn't conveyed what the big deal is, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the language, not the content, right? Mm -hmm. Or this guy sounds like a dork. You know, I don't want him to read Al Ma'ri and say this this is you know it's pedestrian. I don't want him to read the Quran and say this is pedestrian. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Droge might say, well, what about the parts that sound pedestrian? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I don't know that he would use that word, but what about the parts that sound ordinary? Or, you know, we don't want to make the mistake of embellishing or over. No, absolutely we don't. But we also have to not make the mistake of underselling the parts that, that there is a consensus are transporting or beautiful, right, among listeners uh, and among end users. So it's a balancing act. Okay, okay. So now a big question about how to render translation that is sensitive to the target language, keeping in mind uh, aspirations to communicate the beauty of the text or aesthetics generally. Uh, what register of English do you use? We still see translations. I think the study crown might do this, but I, I could be mistaken, that um, use King James-like English with thee and thou and ye. Yeah. Uh, that can be useful to differentiate between second person singular and second person plural. Yes, yes, yes. But it also is meant to elevate the register of the text to something recognizably scriptural. Yes. Uh, yeah, what do you think about that? I understand the impulse. I don't think it works, you know, with my daughter uh, who picks up the Quran and says, uh, who doesn't know Arabic and says, you know, uh, what is that? What, is, what did that surah mean? The one that we just heard. And um uh, I think that it 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 alienates the reader, and I think that the that you don't want to alienate the reader. I also think that even though, again, the impulse is understandable, if I want to take this text and show it to a colleague in the comparative literature department at Yale, and say, "Hey, look at this amazing passage," uh, and it's full of these and thous and thys, uh, it's going to be jarring for them, mm -hmm. uh, and they're probably going to immediately think, "Oh, I suppose this is trying to be like the King James Bible." Um, of course, of which one can legitimately ask the same question, because as 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 we know, I mean, I'm I'm deeply attached to the King James version because I'm a lover of English literature, and not to know to not know that text is to not understand a lot of things that came after. Mm -hmm. But um, but is that the version that I would give someone if a young if a student came up to me and said, I, I want to read I want to read the Bible, wh which one should I read? I, you know, typically I suggest the Jerusalem Bible, um, but. I can I can imagine not picking the King James yes. unless yes. the student is a student of literature and says I'm really into English literature, which is the yes. one I should read. So yes. right, I mean for 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 obvious reasons. Because this hasn't happened with the Quran, right? So there's been no Quran translation except maybe Arbery, uh, that has acquired a kind of um uh, I won't say iconic, but almost fetishized, you know, status. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's actually where I wanted to go next was Arbery. Uh, just a quick question on Arbery, because I, I think your yeah your description is really uh, spot on. That um, in some circles, Arbery is held as um, the only one who was able to communicate something, not all, but something of the beauty of the original in yeah. English. Uh, I've noticed that there's a there's at least one browser that I've seen online that presents translations, but only Muslim translations, except for Arbery. Arbery is also in there. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm, that gives me a sense, and you can confirm or just pass on this, that even among Muslim circles that might be inclined to say, well, to understand the theology, you must come from the perspective of, of a believer and translated text, except Arbery really did a good job. Well, so, I, think many now, of those Muslims, think of I think many of those Muslims think he was a crypto Muslim or uh, had, had secretly converted. Um, either they, 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 they convinced themselves of that in order to be able to include him in such, in such uh, a corpus, or um, they see, they recognize that attachment or whatever, that love of the text. Um, I think that's an unfortunate leap 
I mean, he may or may not be Muslim. I don't think it matters. I think if we're going to look at a translation, we should judge it on the on the on its merits uh, globally. But you but you raise an excellent point, which is you know to understand the theological. I'm not especially interested when I translate in trying to explain the theological. If one wants to understand the theological, we have a immense exegetical tradition, uh, much of which is now being translated into English. And there are translations that go out of their way to explain a lot of the doctrinal and theological issues. I'm, you know, I'm interested, and so this is me, I'm speaking only about myself, but I'm interested in a Quran translation that is on the page and free of notes in a way that, Ar that Arbery translated, mm. um, or that Khalidi, so I, my, my preference is for Khalidi, mm. and I actually dispute that Arbery is the one translation that does that. I think if, if there is one translation out there that tries to capture the Quran's um, Aesthetic qualities and also it's to use Droge's word, it's roughness. I think Khalidi does an excellent job of that. Darif Khalidi, professor, uh, most recent at the American University of Beirut, maybe at Cambridge before then. Uh, yes, yeah, so I believe, uh, like Arbery, Sir Thomas Adams, professor of Arabic at Cambridge. Okay. Well, uh, well. Maybe that's why he translated the Quran. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm glad he did. But that uh, translation is not very well known, even though it no, Did it come out with a major press, maybe Penguin, but I might Knopf. be Knopf. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I find that interesting. It's not a go-to translation, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, I don't see it referred to. So what uh, I mean is that when I'm looking, when I'm do, looking for something, I, I I go to more than one, but it I essentially do Khalidi, Abdul Halim, Yusuf Ali, um, Jones, mm -hmm. uh, Hamidullah in French. I have the good fortune of knowing French, as you do, so I can go to that. Um, and then depending on what I'm doing, I may look at others, but those are usually the ones I used to triangulate or to, to hone in on something. Uh, Arbery is not usually one I look at. Uh, the other one that I really like is Wahiduddin Khan. Hmm. It's also not very well known, but it's very straightforward for one of a better a better term and there's something to be said for just kind of a straightforward you know not worry about um about uh you know it's unmassaged you know it just yes. tries, it tries to do the do yes. the work so that helps me as i think about things but but certainly in that group is always holiday for me and almost almost never arbory interesting interesting okay but that, again that's me that's a personal thing um well, in just a moment, I'd like you. I'd like to ask you to read um, one or two of your translations of short surahs, and then we'll speak about. But one one last question I want to get to before we um, we start maybe with um, surah al zanzana um, is to ask about something you alluded to, which I mean, you basically let on that for you, you know, it's, it's the quality of translation and not the theological or religious affiliation of the translator that matters um, is that right fair enough okay i mean there is i mean there's a bit there's a recognition i think within translation studies quranic studies translation there's a recognition or an, a non recognition but there's a, a concession to the idea that there are muslim translators yes and, -Muslim yes. Translators, and of interest to perhaps some of the people tuning in or listening um many muslim scholars of quran translation also differentiate between the ahmadiyya the ahmadi translations mm -hmm. and the non Ahmadi, those who are feeling particularly um, doctrinal will group the Ahmadi with the non-Muslim translators. I've seen but that in I, web browsers. Yeah. But I think the responsible way, uh, if one thinks that's important, is simply to say Ahmadi Muslims or Ahmadis Muslims. Um, Non-Muslims. But the, but the thing is that it then flattens all the non-Muslims into a, a category. And I think that's unfortunate. I, for me, I find interesting the differentiation between, say, convert uh, Muslims and non-convert Muslims in their translations, or um, to the extent that we have any biographical information about it, um, academic non-Muslim translators versus uh, lay or believer versus non. I think non I think it, it would be responsible to. I don't think that's the way to think about it. But if one is going to think about it that way, I think one should be more responsible about the category. Yeah. So I'm really interested in this question. Uh, I, I teach in a department of theology where. Almost all of my colleagues are working on Christian or Jewish, mostly Christian theology. Um, we have a large section of Bible. And um, I imagine in certain Christian circles, the, the similar questions come up. But in the circles I run in, in Department of Theology at Notre Dame, like no one ever asks, you know, if the, uh, the, the latest Bible translation 
um, you know, is this reliable? Asking themselves, was it done, in fact, by believers or not? I mean, it's just philo it's philology only. So, but I, I, th I can see the coherence of someone who would say, listen, um, you need to render into a new language a theological, uh, theological points um, and uh, questions about, for example, uh, God's nature and God's relationship with humanity, which are articulated in the Quran. Um, those are theological questions. And obviously, there's a long tradition of thinking of uh, thinking through these things. And therefore, it can only properly be addressed and articulated by someone who thinks theologically. And by necessity, a non-Muslim cannot think theologically, at least not in conversation with the text. Yeah. So the problem with that is what if you are a Muslim and you don't want to think about it theologically? So the example I can think of is I trans I've translated uh, Ayatul Kursi. Um, so this is, uh, what is that? It's uh, Surah Baqarah 255. Sorry, Ayatul Kursi, not Ayatul Kursi. Yeah. So, so Allah, la ilaha illa huwa, huwa al-hayyul qayyum. All right. The living, the eternal, the subsistent, the everlasting. It's always rendered that way. And those, those uh, characteristics um, have an epithets have been the subject of a huge amount of uh, discussion and debate theologically within um, Islam Islamic tradition. And I render that uh, without beginning or end. Okay, that's right. um, he without beginning or end. And so presumably the criticism from the from the people Sorry, this is specifically the word Qayyum? al al Qayyum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you know the 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 question uh, I was asked by um, Devin Stewart and, and Joseph Lowry, right? So pro professors and Nora Schmidt, right? So professors of Quranic studies, Islamic studies, law, you know, theology, you name it. Uh, they, first they said, "Oh, that's cool," right? And then, of course, in order for me to help me think it through, they said, "Well, you know, are you sure you want to abandon living and whatnot?" And I said, "Well, I don't have no, I have no problem with that being the understanding theologically, right?" But here's this beautiful passage that Muslims memorize very, very early on in their lives that they that they have displayed in their homes that, you know, that they recite to protect them. And um, and I want to render it in an English that is going to going to convey um, this the grandeur and the majesty of God. Right. And um, and I said, well, what does to me, what does it mean that the speaker who is purportedly God here is saying that he's living in an everlasting? It's that he's just always around. I mean, it's just it, it, ever since the beginning of time and will always be here. And the next line is partly what authorizes me to do this because the next line, which is uh, <laughs> not, you know, untouched or unreached by years, right? Or sleep, I render unwearying and untouched by time. And I capitalize time, hmm. right? So for me, not sleeping or not means can't weary. And uh, the, the gnome and the, the years is about time. He's timeless. And so um, I, I can easily see someone saying, but that's not at all what it says. To my answer to which would be, that's exactly what it says, right? That's exactly what it says. Um, it's just that there's this attachment that is completely explicable, understandable, and even correct to these terms because of their the way they've played out in doctrinal um, not only just doctrinal discussions, but doctrinal disagreements. And so people say, but no, but I need hay to mean living, right? I, I need these words to mean these things in order for the edifice of the theological discussions to remain standing. And that's fine. And so then my answer to that person, if they said it to me, would be, okay, then go read the study Quran. Go read um, Muhammad Asad, go read another translation and find out what it means. Go read tafsir, exegesis. I'm not trying to tell you um, uh, how to be a Muslim by reading my translation. I'm trying to share with whoever is willing to read this what I hope are translations of these passages that elevate from the relatively, I think, average translations that are out there to a higher, uh, and I don't by this mean to suggest that I'm especially good at this, but even if it's, a, in my mind, even if it's a slight improvement, it's worth doing. Thank you. So that, so the, the theology, it's not that I check theology at the door, 
Not at all. It's just that it's not going to be the driving force for me. Yes. And I can say there are 80 other translations you can go to. I myself do that. When I'm looking at a translation, I don't ever just look at one. I look at four or five or more. There's no reason why the reader can't do that as well. But keep in mind that the non-Muslim reader, right? What, what is the question we always get asked as people in Quranic studies? Although I, it's not clear whether I'm in Quranic studies, but but um, as people who are interested in the Quran, you know, what's a good translation of the Quran? And they mean one. They want to go out and buy one. Right. They don't want to go out and buy five. So, uh, you know, for me right now, for my money, it's still holiday. But I, I typically ask people, I say, you know, what is your what is your motivation? Like, do you want to understand Islam better? Do you want to read the text because it's supposed to be this, you know, this text that's that's advanced as, you know, a masterpiece of some kind? Are you interested in comparative religion? Are you interested in its theology? And then I usually recommend the translation and I often say, do you read English, uh, French? Do you read German? You know, Paret, if you're interested in, kind of, you know, in his commentar, if you want to read the, or Jones, uh, you know, the much more commentarial, right? Now, of course, Angelica Neuwirth's um, uh, uh, translation uh, commentaries appeared in English, appearing in English. Um, so that we have, we have a lot of options now, I think, uh, where we can send people who are interested in specific things. But if it's just going to be the one book on your shelf with relatively few notes that you're going to read, um, uh, I, I still think it's Khalidi and the one the one I'm producing isn't even the whole Quran it's just the passages that I think are important for Muslims the devotional what I call I'm calling the devotional passages okay that's a perfect segue thank you so much very uh, smoothly done uh, because I'd like to read a couple of passages um, uh, that you've translated or that are part of the book that we'll speak about at the end that you'll be um, producing if we can share that news um so uh starting with zalzala or zilzal uh mm -hmm. so would you read for us your translation of the surah and then we'll speak through it sure and so what i'll do is i'll read the version that it exists in now um and then uh if time permits i'll i'll read a version i published uh you know 15 years ago in the journal of quranic studies which i think it's an improvement on um so both are by me um so mine goes it's called convulsion in the name of God, ever compassionate and full of compassion, when the earth convulses from its every core, from its very core, when it spews out remnants from its every pore, and bewildered people ask, why, what for? That day the Almighty shall make the earth reveal what he has in store. People huddled in batches will be shown their actions, and those who've done an iota of good shall see it, and those who've done an iota of ill shall see it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe maybe before we go back to the earlier version of this translation, um, you could just talk us through this, what we were thinking of, what was determinative in your choices of, of words and expressions. Sure. Uh, and actually, you know, this is a surah that Michael Sells has written about as well. Yes. Where he for for those who do not, sorry to interrupt, but for those who do numbers instead of titles, this is sort of 99, just if you want to look at it, friends. Yeah. Yes. yes, that's right. And I, uh, I'm an advocate for always using both number and name. Uh, and then, you, then, then everyone knows what's going on. Uh, yeah, so for me, it was important because this surah has certain um, uh, features, uh, literary and rhetorical features that are quite obvious to the anyone who reads it closely, um, such as the long uh, vowels, the the a l sound al uh, al uh, ma, this kind of thing. I thought the English needed to do the same thing. So you know, when the earth convulses from its very core, it was important to me that the v and the c of very core will already be evoked by the C and the V of convulses. Um, evidently, I've made it rhyme. So core and poor and for and store. Uh, further in the surah, for example, um, uh, batches. Really, it's the word groups, right? Oh, into separate groups. Mm -hmm. But I wanted it to um, match actions. So the at sound, the lack kind of A in English. Um, the use of iota. Can I just follow up on that? Is this ashtet? Yeah. The Arabic word behind it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But did you want the accidents from the Arabic in the English? So I don't ever worry about it matching. So if I notice that there's something going on in a surah in the Arabic, I try to find a way to have something going on in the English. Got it. Okay. okay. It doesn't have to be the that's thing the that's going yeah. on in the Arabic because okay. that is really quite constraining. The best example of my failure to do this is when I translated sort of Tariq, where a lot of the a lot of the sounds are effectively the active participle sound of Arabic, right? So it's thaqib, right, and hafiz, 
But then you find it in the longer words like sara'ir. So ra'ir at the end or tara'ib, ra'ib at the end. It's the same shape that's been produced in a different word. There's no way in English, to begin with, you couldn't even use active participles, right? So it will be a, uh, it will be a waste of time to try and find active participles in English that yes. do it. Yes. And so in that particular translation, I experimented with something. I decided, what if I just make sure that certain letters repeat throughout? And I picked a series of letters and make sure that I made sure they repeated throughout so that the English was doing something conscious uh, rhetorically, um, like the Arabic was doing something conscious, but not, but not the same thing. Um, and back to this one, you know, using the, the word iota, I thought it was important to For use. Zarra, right? For right? Yeah, you know, uh, people would, uh, I thought I, there's, a, there's a way in which, I don't know how to say this in any kind of sophisticated way, but but I'm attentive also to the idea or or or, or um, sensitive to the idea that you want things to sound sort of the way people think God should sound in English, right? So this instinct to go towards the King James. And so in one of my translations, I, I talk about uh, the Alpha and the Omega, for example, right? I, I try to introduce when it seems entirely, actually see Omega and the Alpha in that translation. Um, Things that will evoke other scripture in some way or other, or another language. So iota for me has a kind of Greek, old, you know, so there are op options. One, my original translation of the surah um, actually uses the word fraction. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's because I liked the fact that it matched with action. Mm -hmm. But as I've since learned, uh, something I always knew, but I never really thought about because I wasn't doing translations that rhyme. Um, the great translator and even greater poet, Peter Cole, said to me, you know, the best rhyme is the one that you don't notice. Mm -hmm. And um, and there it was so obvious, the fractions. And of course, it's not, not even what the Arabic says, mm -hmm. right? But if it's not going to be what the Arabic says, it might, be, might as well be the word I want. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't say iota either. But yes. for me, iota, for me, iota... It's an interesting case. I don't know if it's worth spending too much time on, but Dharra uh, is almost always translated as Adam. Adam. As what I I've noticed, yeah. uh, which um, m may be a bit a bit too uh, sci scientific or scientific. Well, as you know, a lot, especially Muslim translators, feel like there's more science in the Quran uh, than probably there is. Uh, and so uh, they can t often take these opportunities to uh, to do that. And um, it's also a modern. It's the it's the modern word, and so um, uh, yes, I I suggested in a discussion recently the, the new, newer translations of this type. I have to update it to Quark or something. But um, um, well, I so, uh, can I just say in fact so, the tafsir the tafsir just defines it as something very small. Some some tafsir traditions say something smaller than an ant, and obviously the point yeah. is something small. It's I think I think if I were if you know, if you and I were translating it again, and we were going to do something, I would go with mustard seed, um, just because that it, that does appear in the Quran. It appears in the parables, mm -hmm. and it really is one of these scriptural images about size that that belies immensity, right? And and I think I think it works nicely here. Mm -hmm. You only need that little amount. Actually, it's a lot, right? And so, uh, but of course, that is really far <laughs> from from Zarra. So because uh, there's then, no mustard. I mean, you commented on this, but I mean, readers will immediately notice that uh, your um, your translation of the surah largely rhymes. Uh, are you the first one to try to um, come up with a rhyming translation of the Quran in English? Uh, not of the Quran. Uh, there are famous ones in German, um, and uh, occasionally people uh, will translate into rhyme. I even when I was visiting the University of Edinburgh once, I found in the Montgomery Watt papers he had translated. Uh, some surahs into rhyme. Reynold Nicholson, famously in his uh, History of Arabic Literature, does it. And people are, are, are variously successful. Um, uh, my own interest in translating, uh, retranslating many surahs was precisely the fact that rhyme was being ignored, especially uh, in the short surahs. About roughly 84% of the Quran is in rhyme. And um, that's been a challenge. I mean, this is a good point at which to read my, my previous translation of this, where I think uh, you'll agree, uh, the rhyme is too heavy uh, and interferes. It goes, when the earth is convulsed with, convulsed with convulsions and the earth has expelled its burdens and everyone asks what ails it and questions, on that day shall the earth recount its narrations as compelled by your Lord's inspiration. So it's, you know, it, it's fine. And when it came out, people liked it. But I think, you know, when the earth is convulsed with convulsion is not as good as when the earth convulses 
from its very core. That's an interesting case because, in fact, the root zalzala is repeated actually in the Arabic. So your initial translation reflected that um, transparently, right. um, but your new translation is, uh, I, I would say, especially especially attentive to the target language. Yeah, and and still has that C and V. I'm still evoking mm -hmm. sounds from the original, but Arabic, as you know, as you know, the Arabic does that repetition for a specific reason. It's the way the language works. Um, English doesn't work that way, you know. Yes. Uh, we, I don't say, you know, I, I'm I'm happy to see you a, a great happying uh, mm -hmm. or a great happiness. I should say, right? Um, yes. We say we say things differently. We use very, right? We use very. I'm very happy to see you from its very core, right? I mean, I tried to do that. Yes. I have to say, you know, I I, I I think it's, with the short surahs, it's it's relatively easy to do because you're looking at the whole thing on one page and you can kind of globally have it at work. It's much harder when you're dealing with slightly things that are slightly longer. Um, well, let's try to get one or two more in. Um, if Can you can you stay with me a bit longer? Absolutely. Here, if you don't mind, I'd like to read my, my first translation that I've now moved away from before my second. Uh, which is uh, Surah Inshirah, yes. uh, uh, Consolation. So the, the translation I published in, I think it was 2006, is uh, in the name of God, full of compassion, ever compassionate. Did we not your breast prize open? Did we not your back on burden of the weight on it enlighten? And did we not your good name strengthen? With all distress comes easiness. Yes, with all distress comes easiness. So when you are free, concentrate and upon your Lord, contemplate. And I think it's fair to say the reaction to this was pretty good. People thought, oh, that's cool. Uh, he's done the rhyme. He's, you know, he's kind of reproduced it. But the problem is, that, of course, it's quite wooden. No one speaks like this in English. Uh, and uh, and I'm still um, uh, wedded to the Arabic syntax, right? Uh, it, I'll read the, the newer version and we can, we, can, we can talk. So the new version is called Solace. In the name of God, ever compassionate and full of compassion. Didn't I soothe your heart <clears throat> when you were down? Remove the burden that weighed you down. Lighten the load that kept you down. Raise you up and bring you renown. This shall pass. This too shall pass. Mm -hmm. When your work is done, attend and turn to your Lord. It's a very different affect. Very, very interesting. Very interesting to see the translation of this shall pass. I don't know if you want to start there or start somewhere else. But well, I'm, I mean, know. I sat there going, you know, we all know in Arabic, right? Even if you're not someone who um, uses the Quran much or is Muslim, you know, in the Mal also use it. It's just very famous. With, you know, with uh, um, with difficulty comes ease or with ease comes difficulty. Après la pluie vient le beau temps, right? I mean, these expressions that you know in languages and you just, uh, you know, um, you, they become part of the language. And the problem is that there is no such expression in English. Uh, I mean, there are some, but it struck me, well, you know, the other thing, I think far more radical than that, if radical is the right way to convey this, are two other things. One is to go from the first person plural to the first person singular. Yes, right? so yes, it, in the first verse. Yeah, because, yeah. And, and the reason for that was, I thought the Arabic... Alam nashra, right? Is alam nashra, alam did we nashra. not? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Arabic, it is not unusual... Or in no way does one respond as an Arabic um, uh, listener or reader to the plural when God is speaking. Mm -hmm. But to this day in my classes, students say to me, who's the we again in this passage, right? Uh, we, we've lost the royal we. Um, um, and we may have even lost the last great user of it since she passed uh, last month or early this month, Queen Elizabeth. Um, so, uh, and then this surah is so intimate, right? It's about, don't it's don't worry. I'm I'm here, uh, and and so I wanted that to be represented by I. The other thing is theology tells us that alam nashrah laka sadrak. Did we not literally? Did we not open your breast? Um, is an allusion maybe to the story about told about Muhammad and the angels coming and purifying his heart and so on? But the expression doesn't mean that. Ishrahli sadri means comfort me. Ishali hmm. said doesn't mean prize my breast open. And so I thought, why not go with what it means, as it were? And this would be a perfect place where the theologian would say to me, but, but, and I would say, yes, but don't worry, it's in the note, right? So I have, a, I have a note in the back of the book, which says, this is traditionally translated as follows. Um, it's not that I don't think it 
maybe also says that. Maybe it does. Maybe it alludes to that. But I want the reader, especially the reader encountering this surah for the first time, to come away and say to, 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 to themselves, wow, this is a surah about the intimate relationship between the God speaker and the addressee, whoever those people are, entities are, right? It's saying it's okay. And this too shall pass in English to this day says that, mm -hmm. right? So the, the two, ver two verses are identical. I think they are in Arabic, but yes. you've added the, the two T-O-O. -O. Well, there's one, mm -hmm. there's one difference in the two verses in Arabic. It's the addition, difference of one word. Is the fa. Fa. So I've added one word. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I often do this, and I don't always signal it. I will often do something in a translation because the Arabic does something, but it's not always the same thing. Mm -hmm. so that, and that's for me. That's private. Right? It's like yes. I, I'm happy that I, I mean, we've talked about it here, but I, would, I wouldn't have a note saying, oh, I've added the two because there's a fa in the, yes, in yes. the Arabic. It's irrelevant to the reader. But now people know because you've spoken about it here. Some people will know, yeah. Well, yeah. one last one, if we can, and then yeah. we'll wrap up. So uh, if we can speak about a, a passage that you've translated in your new, new book, which I want to give you a chance to promote, uh, which is known to many people, the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq. So could you read that? Yeah, so this is held by many to be the first revelation. This is uh, told, um, uh, recounted as a, as a encounter between Gabriel, who's bringing the word of God, and asks uh, the Prophet to uh, Prophet Muhammad, I guess who's not a prophet yet, who asked the man Muhammad uh, to read, and it's this famous opening word. It's, it's sort of ninety six, just to mention yeah, the numbers. Yeah, often translated the clot or the blood clot, uh, things like that. Uh, and so the opening word is famously read or recite, and that word is related to the word Quran, and so people often translate it that way. Um, and um, and that clot is is important. Uh, because it's supposed to show that God is describing the beginning and the creation. So it, it's a quite a beautiful um, uh, opening. It's quite powerful as Arabic, I think, you know, as, as, a, as a sentiment. I, I decided to translate uh, Iqra as proclaim. Um, and, and here too, you know, um, I simply, it's not that I don't agree with the, the doctrinal and theological uh, explanation and translation. Maybe it's correct. But I was trying to think in presenting this Surah to the English reader, you know, what what kind of um, mode do I want them to be reading in? And so there's someone saying to the addressee, this is the thing you're going to have to proclaim, right? Uh, and, and that you're eventually going to have to take beyond you, right? So it's not just the uh, the angel figure speaking to the future prophet figure, but that future prophet figure has then taken it to the world. And whether one thinks Muhammad is a prophet or not, it is a fact that he then brought this to the other people and then said it to them. And so this reads to me a much more, um, it's much more, uh, uh, it's not only much more intelligible to the Anglophone reader, but I don't think I lose anything thereby, right? And that's the big question, right? Um, I feel like I must quote um, my, my dear colleague, Robin Cresswell, who's here at Yale, who's also a translator, who once said uh, to a group of editors of the Library of Arabic Literature, we were doing a workshop on translation, and he said, translation is damage control right and and that's just, just liberating that's right you obviously you know people say oh don't you worry about sacrificing something of course we're always sacrificing something there's no there's no translation even the most quote unquote literal that isn't sacrificing something among other things it's satisfying it might be sacrificing beauty for example but but we're all sacrificing something so we get to decide what we're going to sacrifice and i was okay letting go of re read or recite in this one and going with proclaim um the other thing that's interesting about this is because most people translate it clot, they then translate the line, um, what humans did not know, what man knew not. And they're basically attached to this clot sound. They go, oh, this is perfect. Here's a rhyme that I don't have to worry about because it's automatic. And so I resisted that urge completely. And my so my translation reads, in the name of God, ever compassionate and full of compassion, proclaim in the name of your Lord, your Lord who created created humankind from a simple clot. Proclaim, your Lord is generous. Through the pen, he taught humans what they did not know. And, you know, what they did not know is much more powerful than what they knew not. Even as a, like, what did he show? He taught them what they didn't know. That is how we would rhetorically say that. Mm. Uh, and so um, that's that was a part. But I have to say, um, this is not me uh, or only me. I showed um, the translations that are going to form the basis of this book 
to the to, to Peter Cole, a uh, great poet and translator. And uh, it was he who said to me, you know, open things out, make them sound more like English. You know, you're taking this to the world, right? At some level, you want a reader who picks this up and reads it to read it and feel, okay, I get it. They don't have to love it. They don't have to like it. It's not about religion. It's not about theology. It's about language, right? I mean, we don't read the Quran and go, oh, well, that was ho-hum. I mean, we might have questions about textual history. You might question, have questions about adjacency of verses and so on, but no one says it's it's bad Arabic or it's terrible or it isn't, it isn't you know, doesn't elevate or doesn't have the, poss the, the ability to move people. And so, you know, you kind of owe it to yourself and to the Quran to do it in a way that's not, you know, did we not your breast prize open? Right, um, which which is you know ho hum, as opposed to didn't I soothe your heart when you were down, right? Just totally different. And so you know I drank that Kool Aid, and um, I'm grateful to Peter because he spent a lot of time pointing out to me how things could be improved and where they should be improved. And um, and the book, yes, I I don't know how public this is, but it is under contract with a uh, university press dear to your and my heart, uh, and. Um, and uh, I suppose we'll see the light of day in late 2023 or early 2024. Yeah. Can you share a title? The... Sorry? Can you yes, share the title? Called... Yes, it's called The Devotional Quran, Surahs and Passages from the Heart of Islam. Great. And I should say that the, from the heart of Islam was added by the press. Uh, I had it as the devotional Quran, Surahs and Passages. Uh, the... well, I can't even remember what I had, but that's what it is now, from the heart of Islam. So, well, I'd like to um, convince you, if I can, to, to come back and, and, and take us through some more uh, surahs on a second session. But uh, thank you so much for this session. Um, oh, it's, very, it's very kind of you. I'd be delighted to. Actually, I, I think it could be quite different if we looked at long surahs where I use very different strategies. Hmm. I'd be happy to talk about that when your, um, when your uh, viewers are bored of everyone else who's brilliant out there. <laughs> and I'll, I'll happy be, happily be an interloper on, on the long surahs and how to translate them. Beautiful. Thank you so well, much. Well, I'm not to translate them. <laughs> Thank you again. And no, uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Gabriel. Always yeah. a distinct pleasure to be in your company. Pleasure is mine. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars, and um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos, starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.